So anyway, God's been real good to us. I, I know that uh, you, you've seen, if you've gotten the notes, and uh, what today we're dealing with, we're dealing with the whole woman. You know, I've been in a series called The Whole Family. That's our, our uh, whole in one, but it's about the whole family. We started on Mother's Day with whole men. And I talked to you guys about how to be a whole man because your wives deserve whole men. They deserve the kind of family that God intends for them to have. Your job is to provide that and to take care of those needs that they have because they have needs that are different from your needs, as you will see today. But, uh, but that's our job, men, and so it takes a whole man to do that. You can't be in halfway and you can't have all these dysfunctions and disabilities and all that other kind of stuff and be a whole man. So we want, to let the, we want to let the Lord change our life and make a difference. And then I went to whole couples. Then I went to whole singles because all of you guys are in the family. And then we went to uh, some child-rearing stuff. I talked about the Elijah generation. And uh, I know if you didn't hear that, you need to just go back to that Sunday and listen to that because I just kind of got on a rant about, about what, what the, the millennials are and what they're headed to, and what's going to happen, and what God says he's going to do with this generation. And so anyway, it's, it was kind of a prelude to, to I shared that I'll be teaching the book of Revelation on Sunday morning in here. Uh, and and by, at the end of the summer, I'm not, I'm not going to start where everybody's leaving every week and every other week and all that other kind of stuff, because uh, you're not going to have to know every single thing about it, but you're going to need to at least be able to stay in the flow of what's going on. But anyway, so we now, now on Father's Day, here we are on Father's Day preaching to mom. Uh, th- thought it would be good. I mean, turnabout's fair play, right? You know, I preached to the men on your day, and now I'm going to preach. You know, I always thought that, and this was something. I've been a pastor for 42 years now, 42 years. And I always thought on Father's Day that you ought to, you shouldn't preach, shouldn't bring all the men to church and preach to them on Father's Day, something for them to have to change to do, to be, because uh, you ought to preach to the wives because it's, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's Father's Day, it's their day, and then Mother's Day, it's her day, and so I always thought that, so this is the first year I've ever done this. Uh, how did, did you notice, or how do you like it, or does it matter to you one way or another? No, Pastor, I'm coming every week. Okay, well, that's fine. You're coming every week regardless, so that's great. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it is, just so God said it to us. You know, that's all that matters to me. And that's really the way I, I try to be. I mean, it doesn't matter to me what the Lord wants me to say. Uh, just, just let me know, you know. And I, and, and I know some of you are sitting out there, you're going, Mo, I wish God would let me know. Because you're thinking God does something different for me than he does for you. You know, you're thinking, because I'm a preacher and I've been there for 42 years and faithfully serving the Lord with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my mind, you think I would get something. No, never mind, wait. Uh, forgive that. Uh, I feel like that sometimes, <laughs> don't you? You've been serving the Lord a long time. Where's my stuff? You know? I gave up everything for you, and what did I get? Nothing, you know? You get the feeling that way at times, but uh, and I feel that way too. And but you, you, you kind of, yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, you kind of thinking, uh, uh, yeah, if God would just come down and talk to me like He talks to our pastor, because our pastor talking about it, He's always hearing from the Lord. So I, you know, I know. I mean, I don't ever hear from the Lord because I must not be good enough, or I'm a sinner, or whatever it might be. No, no, no. no. The way I hear from God, the same way you hear from God. I hear it in my heart. I hear it in my. And, my, and that voice on the inside, some people call it conscience, you know, uh, it's the Holy Spirit working in you. I mean, it, it, you just get the sense, and you get led, and you feel compelled to something, and you're drawn to something, and then you, you're, you just get interested in it quickly, and, it, and so you know, okay, this is it. This is what the Lord wants, and, uh, yeah, yeah. and so all I really strive to do and want to do on Sunday is when you're in here, and, and you're expecting to hear from the Lord that that's what I want you to do is hear from the Lord. Uh, I've tried to restrain myself all these years. Um, I, I do a lot better at it now than I used to do uh, at, at keeping my opinions to myself and um, not allowing, you know, to try to shape everybody's opinions and ideas about things. But, uh, 
Ah, we all get to rant every once in a while. So here we are. Here we are today. I mean, there's so much pressure on women nowadays to be um, super mom and super wife. Uh, man, she's got to be beautiful and talented and got to be great with children, got to be industrious, and all of that's expected, ladies, of you in this crazy world that we live in. And in, this, in order to be this, there has to be a tremendous work of the Lord in, in your lives. And I know that we've said this before. I know that we have said, uh, and you've said with me, I am a spirit. I have a soul, and I live in a body. All right, let's say it together then. You know, I am a spirit. I have a soul, and I live in a body. So in other, to be, in, in other words, to be the total package as, as a woman nowadays, they're going to have to be, there's going to have to be work in three areas of life because you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. So there has to be work in the body, there has to be work in the spirit, there has to be work in the soul. In 1 Peter chapter 3, the Lord gives us a little indication and tries to help us begin to understand what happens in, in your life, ladies. What, what would God, what does God do? What, how does it start in your life? How do you become a whole woman? Because you're going to have to be a whole woman to meet the needs of your family. Now, I'm not telling you you have to be super mom and super woman and super wife and, you know, be gorgeous and talented and industrious and, and patient and calm and sweet and gentle and, you know, all of that. I, yeah, you see what I mean. And I didn't even, I just said the words I could think about at the moment, you know. But, but you, gotta, you have to be all that. So in order for you to be all that, uh, there, the Lord's going to work in three areas of your life. Your, your body, first of all, look, look at what he says. He starts saying, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, what does that mean? That means you, you're married to somebody that, don't, that doesn't give a hoot about God. They, don't, they, don't, they wouldn't read a Bible if, if, if it, they were standing over your grave at a cemetery. I mean, they don't believe in it. They don't, they're not going to do it. They don't care about God. They don't care about anything God, you can do it if you want to, but I'm, I'm good. That's, what, that's who he's talking to right there. All right, he says, so he says to the women, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, uh, so that even if some don't give a hoot about God, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. In other words, God says, whole, you know what whole women can do? Whole women can, um, whole women can communicate without even saying anything. Their body will communicate. In order, to, in order to be a whole woman, you, you, your body has to be affected by this thing because isn't it so easy to really tear things up, especially in your relationship with your husband? One, I mean, it's inevitable that it's going to happen and that you're going to speak yourself and out of control at times because you can speak. See, you, I don't, and how this happens, who did this? Who came up with this statistic? I'll never know. And I don't know how they would have even done this statistic. I don't know if somebody's sitting around with a calculator or an abacus or a <laughs> something and counting how many words women speak every day. I don't know how they came with this statistic, but they said women speak 25,000 words a day. 25,000 words a day. Guys, would you like to guess how many we speak? 12,000. Less than half. Ladies, that explains some things to you, doesn't it? Huh? Yeah. How when, you, when your husband comes home from work and you say, how was work today? And, and, and they, they're very conservative with their words because they only have a few left and they can't, you know. And so they just, they just sum everything up in one word. How, think how economical this is. Fine. It's fine. Fine. What? <laughs> what? I mean, we, we men do that a lot. We do, if you'll notice men, just notice them, ladies. I know you probably have never even noticed this. Just notice how few words they do use. Think about it. When they're walking around the house or when they're meeting with their friends or they playing in some athletic or they're fishing or whatever, I mean, just kind of pay attention and you'll see them, boy, they're just conserving those words because they got to have a few of them left, you know. And that's why whenever you get, you know, when, when he gets home from work, you 
want to talk. You've been home all day by yourself. You haven't used many of your words. And when he walks in the door, it's like, oh, my goodness, it's another human being in the house. What happened to you? And tell me all about it. Because you have plenty of words. We find. So it's really easy is what I'm saying. Can we agree on this? And, and I don't want this to sound as uh, chauvinistically male as it is, but I, I just hadn't figured out any other way to say it to you. Uh, now, for the most part, I'm not talking about every single person because every one of you are going to think of somebody that doesn't fit what I'm about to say as soon as I say it. But it fits the majority of people. For the, for the most part, women... The average woman does not intimidate the average man physically. In other words, I'm not afraid any of you women are going to come over here and pop me upside the head or jump on me or anything like that. Now, you might get in my face and chew, you know, you know but, but, but you're not, I'm not afraid of you that you're going to hurt me in some way. So because of that, the women have to take advantage many times, guys, of whatever tool, whatever weapon she had. And that weapon just happens to be her words. And she can overpower you with her words. She can remember everything that ever happened in the history of the world. Right? Five years ago, you said, and then, well, man, I... And so what this verse is saying is, this verse is saying, ladies... A quick mind and a snappy mouth might get you ahead in the business world, but it's going to work just the opposite at home. The quicker, the snappier, the, the, more, the more your words pierce and, 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 and you're wanting them to make an impact, to change things for the better, just remember this, whatever you're criticizing is probably about to get worse. Because this is the way guys are, especially with our, with our women. We're, we want, we want, we're the men. We're the champions. We're the heroes. We're dad. And uh, when I get criticized by my family, usually what happens in dad is dad says, well, if, I, well, if they don't appreciate it, well, shoot, man, I ain't going to do that anymore. I, too, I had trouble doing that anyway. And he just he goes straight to give up. I mean, he doesn't go like, okay, let's make this a little better. And look. No, it goes straight from, okay, I'm doing it, or I'm not doing it. So be careful. And in, in what, in, in what Peter's saying to us here is, and, and here's your her control in her body. Uh, she's self-controlled in her speech. All right, God's going to have to do that work so that you can be controlled because that's a very hard thing to do, and it's very critical at times. And a lot of times... Uh, it just pops out uh, without you really being aware that um, that it's going to happen, and it's quick, and it's sudden, and it's a burst, and and you know. So the Lord has to control your body so that you can use use your use your your body in another way, rather than to criticize, to redeem, to uplift. All right, here is the second area that God has to work in. God has to work in her spirit. Uh, I'm going to read the first two lines in your notes, if you have them, under her spirit. Hair, jewelry, and clothing drive the feminine world. In today's world, every woman longs for an extreme makeover that will transform her into Cinderella. Peter says that real beauty is the inner self, a gentle and quiet spirit. Hairstyles and jewelry and clothing are only simple, simple accents in the inward beauty of humility. Um, we put so much pressure on women today to look good. I mean, to even go beyond, you know, looking good, to be perfect in some ways. Maybe it's because, guys, we are driven by our eyes I know you know this. Men were designed by God to be uh, stimulated through what they see. Women, you're not stimulated by what you see. You're stimulated by what you hear. 
God designed you to hear things, and that's why words are very important to you, and you hear things, and you and it just goes straight to your heart. Now, we guys, we look at stuff, and that's why pornography is so terrible for men, and it's such an easy, easy trap to fall into because nowadays, I'm not even good on the internet. I mean, I'm really not. I'm not a good searcher, and I'm not a good whatever I don't, I don't, I barely can find what I need, but I guarantee you that I, not even being good at the internet, within 30 seconds could be on some pornography in there, right? I mean, at any time, at any time. And so because of these kind of things, we men have and are, are and our young men are developing um, unreasonable concepts of women and the way they look. Now, I'm not saying, let me put the verses up here because I want to read these to you because you need to see this. Do not let your adornment, this is the next verses after the first one. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Uh, but I'm not against women looking good because the verse, I want you to notice the verse. The verse does not say, do not, do not let your adornment be outward, arranging the hair. It said, what is that little word in the middle? Do not merely. In other words, don't let that be the only thing. That's not the only thing. Now, you know, hair and jewelry and makeup. I mean, I thank God for makeup. I, I'll be honest with you. And, and you look good. You, you do it good and you look good. And it's wonderful. And I enjoy looking at the product of what you do with makeup and all of that kind of stuff. It's great. And God's not against makeup. God's not against you having your hair fixed and, and having on some uh, jewelry and, and, and being dressed nicely. God is not against that. This is just an admonition from him to not let that be the only thing that you think about in life because it's really easy because we put so much pressure on, on you nowadays. But the most important thing about you, according to God, is what happens in your soul. And what's happening in your soul is, uh, well, in, let, me, let me back up. What's happening in your spirit because in your spirit, some things are being created. So the second thing is that God has to get in your soul. Did I give you that? And this is the third one. Okay. Let me go back to this. Because uh, I, I want to I tell you something that I think you need to know and need to hear about this. When you, when, ladies, the reason God doesn't want you to, to merely think about your outward appearance is because if that's the way you begin to live life, you have created a vulnerability in yourself. In other words, you have opened a door in your life that the devil is going to walk through. And he, because here's the truth now, and I'm not trying to be unkind at all, but age, genetics, and gravity are going to change you. And I know our, these men are laughing, but they've got, you know, their chest is down in their drawers now. I mean, it's, uh, the same thing happens to us. Seriously, I mean, it's going to get you. That's, that's all I'm saying to you. It's going to get you. And when it begins to happen to you, if that's all your life is about, then he has a powerful tool to destroy your life with yeah. this. I mean, look at these freaks on TV and magazines and stuff yeah. that have looked like some kind of a plastic some, something. Why? Why did, they, why did they do that? Because of the vanity of getting older. I mean, some of them have real nice jobs. I mean, they, some of them did real good. Some of them look better now than they did like 40 years ago. But, but that doesn't happen very often. So what I'm just saying to you ladies is your husband loves you or he wouldn't have married you. He likes the way you look. Don't, don't get all wound up. I mean, look the best you can. I'm not saying, you know, be dragging around, you know, looking trashy. But, I'm, but, but 
But do the, I mean, don't let that become the focus and the center of your life because it's very easy to do and it's a trap and God has to work in our bo- in the body and in the spirit and then here in the soul. Uh, that's why I got you to say I am a spirit, I have a soul and I live in a body is because the soul is the seat of our will, our emotions. Right, like right now. Right now, you are, are hearing me in your soul. Your soul is where your will lives. I will do this. I will not do this. I think this is a good idea. No, get back, dummy. It's not good. This is the soul. This is where you have personality. This is where, this is where you exist in life. And in order for a woman to be whole, not only does the body have to be able to control its speech and its talk, and the spirit has to look at itself as being beautiful because of what's in me rather than what's on me. And then in my soul, the Lord has to come against uh, what all of us have in our life is an agenda. We have a plan. And we want our plan to work. And when our plan doesn't work, we begin to try to make it work. And as we try to make it work, it begins to affect everybody around us. And so an agenda-driven uh, life, cannot, well, ladies, cannot work in a, in a relationship, in a family relationship. And I'll give you an example. I, I know you guys remember Sarah and Abraham, right? Now, this is some instruction. Uh, Peter's saying, uh, this is a good thing. And then he brings up Sarah and Abraham. Now, just, just I'll take just a second here. Sarah and Abraham are Old Testament uh, people that are basically the fathers of the covenant with the Jews. He's the father of the Jews. As a matter of fact, all the religions of the world claim Abraham as their father. Isn't that interesting? Muslims do. Hindus do. Buddhists do. Christians do. Jews do. Uh, Abraham is one of the most universal people in the Bible. But before Abraham became Abraham, he was married to Sarah, his wife. She was 75 years old when the first real event happened in their life. God said, you're going to have a child. And, oh, you know, that was like, oh. Abraham's name before it was Abraham. Abraham means father of many nations. No, it means exalted father. Abram, what his first name was, Abram, changed to Abraham. Abram means father of many nations. So here is Abram with no children. He's 75 years old or 80 years old. And people say, what's your name, Abram? And when they hear that, they hear father of many nations. How many children do you have? None. None. Uh, what is that supposed to be ironic or you know what and so and so he walks around in his name as father of many nations and his wife's name is not sarah in the old life her name is sarai now sarai you know what it means contentious who in the world would name their child contentious but that was her name so here's old father of many nations and contentious living together, 75, 80 years old, have no child. They're big money people in a place called Ur. <laughs> How would you like to be from there? Where are you from, man? Ur. It's kind of, it kind of sounds like you forgot where, where it was, right? Ur. But anyway, they, they had loads of money. They were fat cats. I mean, they, were, they had it going. And so God said, all right, I want you to leave here and go wherever I'm leading you. And they said, well, where is that? And he said, I'll let you know. And then he said, well, how are we going to get there? He said, I'll let you know. Well, how long is it going to take us to get there? Well, I'll let you know. Uh, When will we know we're there? I'll let you know. And so Abraham naturally started following God under those conditions. I mean, who wouldn't? That's what a dazzling invitation. Who wouldn't take that? And and as he begins to follow him, he goes, he changes his name to Abraham which means exalted father. And Sarah's name became Sarah instead of Sarai. She went from contentious to princess. Sarah means princess. 
quite a change from contentious to princes, right? Only God can do that. But, but here's what happened in the middle of it. And this is why I'm, I'm saying this is something your soul, your agenda, you know, has to be involved in. God has to change. Is because while they were on the way to where God was taking them, which they didn't know, they have to go through Egypt. And they're in Egypt, and, and, and Sarah is 80 years old. Abraham at least is. She might be 79, but she's above 75. And she still looks so good that Abraham is afraid that the king of, of Egypt is going to have him killed so he could have his beautiful wife. Imagine that, 80 years old, and you're still so beautiful. I mean, imagine that. That's amazing. And so Abraham says that Sarah is his sister. No, that's my sister. Now, now think about this, ladies. Think about what, what an insult or, you know, uh, it's cowardly. Uh, it's not something that you would be respectful about, I don't think. To know that your husband it, it tells somebody else that you're his sister because he doesn't have enough courage or he's whatever it is. I mean, you wouldn't be, that wouldn't be like number one on your top list of admirable qualities of my man. This is ad I mean, the fact that he's keeping you alive might be admirable, but you wouldn't like the way he's doing it. But anyway, Abraham and Sarah can't stay away from each other, and the king sees them out in the park one day, and you don't do stuff like that with your sister. And so um, he said, uh, brought Abraham up there and said, hey, man, you don't do stuff like that with your sister. That, that's why my land is being cursed right now. Uh, nothing good is happening in Egypt, and it's because you're in here lying to me about this being your wife, and I'm sitting here trying to flirt with your wife and trying to, you know, get her in my harem, and and I because I thought it was your sister. I was going to give you lots of gold and money for her, but, you know, but this your wife. Man, get out of Get your wife and get out of here, and don't ever come back to Egypt again. Now, you would think that Sarah would have an agenda as a woman and a family and a mama and a, and, a, and a driver of the covenant herself. She's going to be the one that has Isaac that's going to be the progenitor of all of Israel and, and the whole race and everything else. You would think she would be much more uh, uh, agenda-driven than she is because this is why Peter uses her as an example. Because with all of that that just happened to her, and how much disappointment and dishonor from her man. And yet two chapters later, Sarah looks at Abraham and calls him Lord. In other words, the most honorable title, the most respectful way to address someone, my Lord. Right after he did some of the most insulting, embarrassing stuff in denying her and denying their relationship that they ever had. Here's, here's, here's what I'm saying. Sarah went from contentious to princess because of the work God did in her to release the offense and to, and to subject herself under the covering of someone else. Ladies, you thrive under a covering. I know it may sound anti-feminist, you know, and they may clip this out and play it on the internet, but, but you thrive. God says you thrive under a covering. And if you work under that covering, it's great. But, but in order to be there, you got to be a whole woman. All right, so you got to be a whole woman in your body. You got to be a whole woman in your spirit. You got to be a whole woman in your soul. And only God can do those three things to you. Now, let me ask you, what are you going to do with this whole woman? Once you got her, what are you going to do with her? I got an idea. Let's make her irresistible to men. How about that? There are five needs that men have that are greater than all others in our life. This, these needs were identified, and I'll just say it again, by a man that, by the name of Willard Harley. There's a book called His Needs, Her Needs. You can read it. It's a good book. It's good for relationships. It's Willard Harley, His Needs, Her Needs. He interviewed 40,000 people personally. 40,000. That means not 300, like not 120, 
The news media and all these polls that you see every day, they might sample 300 people and say everybody in the country believes that or 200 and they believe. I mean, there are so few people in those polls, it's ridiculous, 40,000, this one is. And identify the top five needs of men. And so, uh, sister girl, <laughs> whole woman, uh, what are you going to do with being whole? Well, God created you for a purpose, created us for a purpose, and one of those purposes is to meet each other's needs. And just like I shared with you on Mother's Day, that she has some needs and that you're responsible for them, and you're the only one that can do some of those things. Also, ladies, I'm going to tell you today that your man has some needs, and you are the only one that can meet these needs. And this is one of the reasons why God put you together so that both your needs could be met and you could both be whole people. Here is number one need for men, sexual fulfillment. That's not a surprise to anybody, is it? <laughs> you know, the number one need of man is sexual fulfillment. Number two is sexual fulfillment. Number three is sexual fulfillment. <laughs> you know, I mean, as we pretty much on the brain, you know. Um, but don't, don't kill us, ladies, because that's, you know, God made us that way um, so that we would... Um, we, that we would have anything to do with you guys, really is what it boils down to. Um, I mean, we have to be so driven, uh, so strongly driven, overwhelmingly driven to create a relationship with a, with a creature that is not like us at all. Yeah, you are a female, whole different gender. We're male. And we do certain things and we like certain things and certain things appeal to us. And they're pretty much the opposite of what you like. So how much time would we spend together were we not driven by this overwhelming desire for sexual fulfillment? Now, that kind of boils us down to a you know, little animalistic kind of a thought here, and I'm not trying to degrade us in any way. I'm just saying, what kind of a genius God would put us together like that. That is, that is brilliant. I mean, if you're going to repopulate the earth, if the earth, if, if, if the earth has to have human beings on it, and you're the way human beings get here, God's got to make sure that, that you get together so human beings will get here. And so what does he do? He gives one of the genders this overwhelming need for sexual fulfillment in their life, and he makes the other ones beautiful. You know? so, I mean, it's just amazing. And so here, here we are with the number one, number one need that we have in our life. And, and God says, all right, ladies, uh, your job is to meet the sexual needs of your man. And as a matter of fact, um, I'm going to give you some verses so you will see this clearly said, and you will stop scowling at me because I didn't say it. All right? <laughs> really. Here it is. I mean, I'm going to just read like, Six verses here. You'll just see what it's saying. Now, concerning the things which you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. How many of you agree with Peter? Now, don't raise your hand. That was a trap. You be smart, man. That was a trap. You know, you ain't raising your hand and saying, I'm not going to touch a woman. I mean, you would be too, my goodness. But uh, that's what he says. It, it, it's really better for men if we don't touch women. That's what Paul said. Now, Paul was... He had been married because he couldn't be a member of the Sanhedrin and not be married, but he wasn't married anymore. When he became a Christian, they evidently took a shovel and buried him out there somewhere and said, he no longer exists. You don't, you're not married anymore. Get out of here. Uh, and then Paul was single the rest of his life. And so here he is telling us, hey, guys, it's better if you don't, if you don't touch a woman. But nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, what does that mean? That means because we're just... Bound by sex is what it means. It means we're overwhelmed with it. It means if we don't if if we don't have some natural release to this, we might we bottle stuff up. We might become some kind of a weirdo or some kind of a molester or something. I mean, think of what it does. It's overwhelming. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I guarantee you, none of us talk about our lives sexually, you know, surface level or some kind of little something like that. But guys, we don't do that. But everybody has issues in their life over sexuality. All guys have issues in their life 
over sexuality in some way. Let eat because of sexual immorality, because you can't control yourself, because God built you with such a drive that he intends for you to have sex. That's why God said, I built you that way. And there are very few of you that aren't built that way. I, I'm not one of them. And I don't know. I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. Yeah, I'm not a gay. Hey, y'all laughing. Y'all thought the same way. I'm serious. Just start submitting and you'll see. Let each man have his own wife. Because sex is so powerful and so overwhelming, he says, get you a wife and let each woman have her own husband. What is the purpose of this? The purpose is so we can have sex and meet each other's needs. Because have you noticed the number one need of women is affection? Now say this with me, non-sexual. Affection is non-sexual. It doesn't mean you work in a plan, guys. It doesn't mean you're being nice because you're trying to work around the back door here, you know. I mean, it, mean, it just means that, y'all stay out of that gutter. It, it just means, <laughs> it just means that, um, that God intends for this to be a part of human life, and it's going to be a part of human life, whether you want it to be or not, whether you think it ought to be or not. It's going to come from somewhere now, ladies. Just let me just tell you that. Somewhere it's going to come from because God just built me in too powerfully for, for that to be just total balled up. I'm telling you, it ain't happening. And sooner or later, it's going to, something's going to pop up there, and somebody's going to say, hey, I will, you know, and there you go. And he's going to be so deprived and, and all of that, he's going to just jump right over there. You know, it's just amazing. I, I mean, I'm just telling you, this is God talking here. God is saying, the reason I did this is because sex is overwhelming. So let, you get a husband and you get a wife, and that's who provides you with, with your sex. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her. Now, isn't it, I, I, was, trying, I was saying this a moment ago, we got sidetracked. Isn't it interesting that the first two needs of men and women, women need affection, which is non-sexual, and men need sexual fulfillment. Both of those are physically uh, uh, altered. You touch, you hold hands, you put your arm around for affection, and you, you know, sexual is totally uh, all physical. But isn't it interesting, and it, isn't this interesting, that women will give sexual fulfillment in order to get affection, and men will give affection in order to get sexual fulfillment. I mean, isn't it funny? The game. Who thought of this? You know, what kind of a what kind of a plan is this, God? So the Bible says, "Let the husband render to his wife uh, uh, the the affection that is due to her. She, you owe her something." Everybody say, duty is sexy. <laughs> I mean, it's your duty. Duty is sexy. <laughs> you know, you say, six packs is sexy. No, because, that, you know, that, you, can't, you can't maintain that. But duty, it's your duty. <laughs> duty is sexy. All right. Um, and likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Now, would you ever imagine the Bible would say that to you? Now, you know, you, I mean, you absolutely can read what that's talking about. That's the Bible talking to you now. That's what it says. That, you know, the husband is just able to provide what you need and you provide what he needs. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And that means whenever I get married that this is not mine anymore. In other words, this right here belongs to Tanya. And she could have that any time that she desired. <laughs> and then, I know, <laughs> isn't it gross to think of your parents? And then, what you see sitting in that last seat on the end down there, that's my property. That belongs to me. And that means whenever I demand it, that, that, that my property comes to me. 
And that's what that means. That's what those verses mean. That that's what our duty is to each other. Now, all I say is, you know, you may not want to do that, but you're just setting yourself up for somebody to come in and take you, mate. I'm just telling you that. That's how powerful this is now. So we laugh about it, but it's really not funny because it's really your, your relationship and your marriage. It's your duty to do this. God says so. Do not deprive. He even tells you what's going to happen if you do. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. Everybody say, a short time. <laughs> with consent for a short time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. So you're, the reason you're going to not submit is because, hey, look, we need to pray, fast and pray some. We're, we're, we're getting too worldly. Our lives are just going in the wrong direction. Let's, let's, let's take a couple of weeks here and, and, and just don't refrain from this, and then, and then we'll spend that time praying and fasting. How about that? And if they say, yep, then you say, okay, it's done. If they say no, it's over. You, you ain't, ain't going to do it. Because uh, you, remember, you don't belong to you. You belong to them. They belong to you. Okay. All right. That's why, that's why an affair is so devastating. Because you're giving away something that doesn't belong to you. And, and, and your wife or mate would be giving up something that doesn't belong to her. She's giving my property to somebody else. That's why it's so devastating to it. And, and so the Bible says, don't, don't do this. Because if you do this, you, you're gonna have, you need to come together again quickly so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, God built us so powerfully sexually that no matter how much we try to cover it up and hide it and no matter how we try to control it and, and, and all of that kind of stuff, it is just overwhelming. And it will not be abated unless it's fulfilled. And sooner or later, if you keep playing that de deprivation game or punishment or whatever it is you're doing with it, the devil's going to take advantage of it. And somebody else will provide it. Because believe me, I don't care what your man looks like. That There's some sister out there wants him. I mean, there are plenty of them that would, be, that would love to have him. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> I like that man. What you talking about? One thing we've learned now that we have the Internet, there are no really boundaries on what people like and don't like, is it? I mean, you know, you can't even name something. You name some kind of, any kind of issue in humanity and, and, and then go Google it in and you'll find a whole bunch of people like fan clubs of whatever you just typed in there. It's unbelievable. So I'm just telling you uh, sexual fulfillment. All right, I know you're ready for me to get off of this. All right, so let's move on to the second one. The second one is recreational companionship. Uh, I'm going to have to pick up the pace real good, so I'm going to just go straight to the chase. This, these comments are out of, the book, out of a book called Wild at Heart. It's a book about men, Wild at Heart, written by John Eldridge. The name's up there. And these are just quotes I took out of there, but I want to use them to show you what recreational companionship is, okay? All right, look at what this says. God designed men to be dangerous. Yeah, God designed us to take chances. God designed us to do uh, stuff that doesn't make sense sometimes and to do uh, ingenious things at times and to do things that nobody would think of because it's too dangerous or something might go wrong or whatever. And God designed us to, to, to charge machine gun nests and to, and, to, and to fight on ships. And God decided, you know, where certain death looked inevitable to charge the shore and to do all. I mean, God created a very unique, God created men to be dangerous. That's what completes our life, <laughs> danger, all right? Every man needs a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. You are the beauty, by the way, <laughs> ladies. You are the damsel in distress, and your man is the hero in every situation. That's what that says. That's ha when a man's, ha a man's happy when he's fighting some kind of battle, when something's coming against his family, or he's rallying the troops, or he's... He's, there's something that he thinks is wrong and he wants to right it. 
And, and so he gets together with other men who have similar feelings about this, and they begin to be a team. And then they have meetings together, and they team up, and they challenge this thing together, a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. Simply look at the dreams and desires written in the heart of every boy. What, what do boys want to be? You say, son, what do you want to be? They always want to be a hero of some kind. They want to be a fireman or a soldier or a doctor or something like that. You know, I mean, they, they, or they, they find something that they idolize and want to be like, and they want to be a hero. So what do you want to be? To be a hero, a warrior, and to live a life of adventure and risk. Sadly, most men abandon those dreams and desires, believing that Christianity is nothing more than pressure to be a nice guy. It's no wonder that many men avoid church, and those who go are often passive and bored to death because there's no battle to fight. There's no enemy to conquer, no beauty to rescue. Life's dull. Life has no adventure. And I'm just saying to you, because men like all that, that usually attracts them to other men. Yeah, other partners, pals, teammates, buddies, cohorts, you know, whatever you want to label them, that they do things with. They go to ball games together because they both like the game and they just have a ball at a football game or a baseball game or, or they get out and if you need somebody to help, they'll call them because they can work and do anything and they just sit out there and they're laughing and they're working. And I mean, just teams, uh, softball teams, baseball teams, bowling teams, uh, any kind of team you can think. Men love to go do things together with other men because of this drive for recreational companionship. Now, what I'm saying, whole woman, is that God wants you to provide this recreational companionship. In other words, get involved in your man's life. I mean, besides what goes on when he walks in the door there. What does he like? Does he go fishing? I, I can't I mean, Get on the boat. Get on the boat. Get out there and say, man, I'll drive this thing. I'll run that trolling motor. I'll learn how to do. And you just get up there and fish, man. And then you can be a cheerleader. You say, you know, after about uh, 45 minutes, you're going to say, you hadn't caught anything yet. You know, you can be a real cheerleader. Or, you know, uh, go to a ball game with him. Let, let me, guys, let me tell you how to help your wife have fun at a ball game. Find out something personal about one of those players on the field. Like, you see number 67 down there? You know, his, his mama just, just went through a bout with cancer, and she survived, and she's just coming to her first game here tonight, and that boy's trying to play his heart out. I guarantee you, every time 67 moves, your wife will be right looking right at 67 and be so involved. Man, I hope 67 teams win. You know, do that. Just like, ladies, when he goes to the mall with you, give him something to hunt because we don't shop. We hunt. I mean, give me something to hunt. I mean, even if you don't, even if you don't want it, you know. I mean, you say, "Look, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a sheer blouse, button up the front, size ten, whatever collar, collar flap, uh, whatever you want on the sleeve." You just give him something, just any kind of thing, and say, "Can you, can you, can you find that?" And buddy, when you walk in that mall, it's gonna be like a hunting dog. It's gonna be. Man, it's gonna be man. Where that? Uh, what store would have that, ma'am? Do you do you have like a white shirt that's here? No, no, no. I mean, but we'll hunt them down. We'll track them down. We'll come back. We we'll come back. We we'll have like five of them on each arm, like that. <laughs> and you'll and you'll look at them and you'll go, "That's just not what I'm really wanting." <laughs> you know, maybe 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 blue or uh, camouflage something. Yeah. Here he goes, takes them back, gets the other stuff. I mean, this, this, this is what, you know, and, and what happens is you begin to build companionship. It's like he's going to slay the dragon. You hold the flashlight, all right? I mean, you got him, babe. All right, huh? One more lick. Yeah, we got him, you know. Become your husband's best friend. I tell you, I go, Tanya does everything. with. I never do anything without Tanya. Tanya's my best friend. I mean, we're... I, I go with her everywhere. I, I, I can't imagine life without her. She, she does everything. Man, she holds the flashlight. I slay that dragon. And then we, then I hold the flashlight and she slays him. <laughs> you know? 
but but the but the point is, she's become my best friend because we do everything together. When we were softball team, man, I had we I played a great softball team, man. We went state, national, all that. Tanya, right there on the side, had a we we were orange and blue and, and royal blue. Uh, sorry, Alabama fans, all that Florida colors. But anyway, uh, we we had orange jerseys, and uh, and she she got the other women on the team to get orange orange T-shirts, and they all put glitter on there and, and put my my husband is number 27, that was my number, or 21, whatever it might be. And uh, and then they had these long horns, these plastic, you remember, you you could get them, I don't even know where you, you would get them now, but they they have a mouthpiece on them and they're plastic and they're, and they go out and they're, they're narrow like this. And then all of a sudden at the end, they got a big bell on them and they're like orange or blue or whatever colors. And you blow it, you <laughs> like that and it goes, Whoa. you've seen them at ball games. Well, she got them, got them all uh, one of those orange horns, and every time something would happen on the field, uh, the whole stands would go, <laughs> you know, like that, and start cheering everything. And we dominated everybody. It was unbelievable. It was like our fans intimidated everybody on the whole complex. It was like, are y'all going to have to play that orange team? Man, you don't want to do that. It's the goal. Man, their fans are going to kill y'all, you know. And, uh, but, but see, see, that's what I'm talking about. And see, what that happens is it makes me say, man, I don't have to have some guy. Uh, come on, Tanya, let's go. Uh, let's go golfing. Uh, you, you drive the cart, and uh, she just talked to me. I mean, she got 25,000 words. Come on, you know? I mean, she, she can talk to me while I'm out there and going, what is that like, you know? Why do you wiggle that club? And anyway, uh, but, but we got some recreational companionship going on here. That's what I'm talking about. All right, so men, what do we need? We need sex, and we need somebody to do stuff with, all right? Number, number three, attractiveness in our wife. Attractiveness in our wife. In other words, we, you've heard the term trophy wife? Mm-hmm. That's real. That's what we want. And that's what we think we have. Or we wouldn't marry you. We think you're a trophy. Now, all I'm saying is make yourself look good. Now, I know some of you, I can hear you saying that ship has sailed, but no, listen. No, listen. Whatever you are, fix it up. I mean, make it look good, as good as you can. Now, you, you can't change genetics, you know, and you can't change the traits you have. You know, if you have a big nose, I mean, you're going to have a big nose. If you've got little beady eyes, you're going to have a little beady eye. You know, if you, you know, if you got fat lips, you, you know, you can, you, you're going to have fat lips. If you got skinny lips, you, I guess you can blow them up like a balloon, but everybody's going, everybody's going to know you look like a freak, you know, <laughs> and uh, just leave them alone. God made you the way he made you because that's the way he wanted you. And somebody loves you that way, believe me. And, and so, uh, you know, we, well, <laughs> he's killing me over here. <laughs> but anyway, you get the point. You get the point. It's it's uh, it, God. God loves you, and and we need to and we need to we need to come together on this attractiveness thing, uh, because uh, you know you you dress yourself up for anybody that's coming to the house. I mean, like almost almost if somebody's coming to fix the you know, fix the sink, you, you know, you're not, you're not going to let him see you without any makeup on, at least a little bit, and, and something on that looks, you know, like something the cats didn't drag up and the dogs wouldn't drag back out, you know. You're going to have some appropriateness and stuff. All right, so if you'll do that for anybody that shows up at your house, do it for your man. That's the number one guy in your life, man. That's the number one person in your life. Doll yourself up. Put a little foo-foo on, you know? I mean, he, he's coming home. Now, think about it. He's coming home from work where he's been around women all day in some form or fashion that are in the business world, that are dressed immaculately, smell good, their hair is fixed, they're appropriate and nice, and, and that's what he's been around all day, and he's on his way home, and he can't wait to get home. And then... Sister Frump meets him at the door <laughs> and had, needs to take needs to wash those things because they, they got this 
profuse odor coming out of them and just looking as nasty. And, and, and I'm just saying, it, he's not going to walk, turn around and walk away, but, you know, you had an opportunity to really do something nice, and you just ran right by it. All right, let's go. Y'all got that, I know. All right, number five, number four, ba- need, we need domestic support. We need to feel like our family's with us, that, that we're a team, that we're not out here by ourselves, that our family believes in us, man. And, and, my, and my wife is going to take care of our kids, and I'm going to take care of our kids, and we both have responsibilities, and she's going to do what she's supposed to do, and I can count on that, and I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. And we work together. With you know, you remember I talked to you about the word fellowship? Just substitute fellowship right here. You know what fellowship means, right? A bunch of fellows in the same ship? All right. Well, this is, this is you and her in this, in this family together. And, and, and you support the work here, and you let him know that, hey, whatever, whatever we need to do, uh, I'll do it because I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for us. We're going somewhere. This is our team, buddy. We, I'm right there with you, man. Come on. If there's a battle to fight, we'll fight this sucker together, man. They won't ever know what hit them. You know, and, uh, or if there's something to do, someplace to be, someplace to go, hey, we need to do something, I'll get up on that ladder. You know, I'll be scared to death, but I'll help you. You know, I mean, we're a team. That's what that's about right there, real need for men. And, and uh, oh, uh, I'm glad I put that up there because I would have forgotten. I'm gonna, this right here is what every man's looking for in his home, okay? You know, this, this uh, partnership, listen to this. It's what we're looking for now. After work each day, his wife greets him lovingly at the door, and his well-behaved children are also glad to see him. Yeah, he enters the comfort of a well-maintained home as his wife urges him to relax before dinner, the aroma of which is already wafting through the air. (laughs) I tell you what they're having, bacon. Um, (laughs) Conversation at dinner is enjoyable and free of conflict. So nice. Later, the family goes out for an early evening stroll, and he returns to tuck the children in bed with no hassles or fuss. Then he and his wife relax, watch a little TV, and retire to the boudoir, all all at a reasonable hour. (laughs) Well, I got to get up and go to work morning. Come on, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. I just, I mean, I, I don't have any, you know, thing else to say about it. I just want, I just thought you might want to see what all men wanted. Uh, cause that, that, that's it right there. Let me give you this last one here. All right. This last one is admiration. Um, I think, I think admiration is probably first. Um, uh, it may be even a little stronger than sex. Men are designed by God to be respected. And we, and we, and, and, we crave it. We desire it. If we, if we are not respected, we don't work right. And by that, I mean, if you somehow are conveying to your man, let me just give you a verse because I know I want you to see this. This is Ephesians 5. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. So men, what are we, what are we commanded by God to give our wife? Love. To love her to let her know that she marches at the head of our parade and there's nothing in our life that we love more than we love her, that she is the center of our world and the focus of our universe. That's what love is. The children don't mean more to me than you do. The dogs don't mean more to me than you do. This house doesn't mean, golf doesn't mean, fishing doesn't mean. You are the most loved and valuable and honored thing that I have in my life. And you convince her of that. That's your job. That's what you do. Women, what you do is this. And let his wife see that she respects her husband. Notice it didn't say husbands love your wives and wives love your husbands. It said husbands love your wives and wives respect your husbands. You know why? Because men see respect as love. We don't need mushy cards. We don't need Valentine candy. You don't even have to give us a card on our birthday. You don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. We don't, I mean, 
I know you like it because those are loving things to do. That's what he ought to be doing to you. Guys, that's just a tip for you, okay? If she's doing something to you, that's because she's needing that. So get on it. That's your job. And, uh, and, 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 but ladies, uh, we, we are driven to be, to be honored, to be respected. I mean, it, it, it's no accident that the first movie that was ever made in the history of the world, the first motion picture, was a, was a film called uh, The Train Robbery. And it was about uh, a damsel riding on a train, and a bad guy comes and robs the train and takes the damsel captive, and then the hero comes over the ridge, along came John, kind of did, and sees the villain down there with the woman and the princess, and he crushes down there and defeats the, the enemy and unwraps her because she's laying on a train track with ropes all around her. That was the first motion picture. And every motion picture since then follows the same pattern. You watch them. There's always a damsel to rescue. Look at them. Any of them taken. Any, I mean, just name a movie, any movie. There's always a damsel to rescue. There's always a villain that's trying to stop us. And there's always a hero that gets the job done. That ought to tell you something. <laughs> How powerful is that? So what you got have to do, ladies, is no matter how much you want to disrespect him, you've got to respect him. And by respect him, I mean you don't have to bow down when he comes in, you know, or, or say things to him like master. Or, you, know, you don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. You just, you just have to respond in, in, in way. You know, 65% of, of communication is nonverbal. You do know that, right? The way you stand, your countenance, you know, your slump, you know. I can tell when I'm talking to you whether you're into what I'm saying or not by the way your body is conveying that back to me. And when you say things, sometimes you're saying something nice, but you roll your eyes or do something like that. That means exactly the opposite, you know, and we all pick up on those cues like that. R respect your man. Don't be telling jokes about him. Don't be, he's not the punchline of every every funny story that happened because he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, he was at least trying. I mean, come on, give him something. But, but you know, I've heard ladies, and seriously, and they don't really mean it, anything by this. They're just not thinking about what, what it is. That would be like in a group of people, like a little prayer group or a little something, and, they would, and, they, and, and the husband's sitting there with them, and, and they say, man, you know what happened? We had the funniest thing happened at the house today. Henry doesn't know jack about fixing anything. Man, he can't fix anything. And just goes on like that. And there's poor Henry sitting over there going, you know, being humiliated. Being humiliated in front of his friends and other guys. Disrespected, dishonored, and rejected, mocked, ridiculed. And... And, and that's harmful, man. I mean, it, you, and then he's supposed to love you like, like he loves himself. I mean, come on. You know, we're talking about needs. We're not talking about wants. We're talking about what, what we have to have, not what we want, but what we have to have. And if you'll do, if you'll do this respect thing, it'll really, really be a big thing. I've seen more divorces. I tell you, well, let's, let me say this. Uh, people can come up. And they can say, I say, what's the problem? They say, uh, you know, our sex life's terrible. He had an affair. Uh, the, she spent all the money. He, you know, he tore up the house. He beats me. I mean, he, they can say all those kind of things, and not one of those things is the reason they're going to get a divorce. The reason they're going to get a divorce is because she doesn't sense that she's loved by him, and he doesn't sense that he's respected by her. So the quickest way to a divorce is just keep on disrespecting. And that'll be the quickest way because he, he can't take that forever. Or quit loving, guys. If you want one, <laughs> quit loving. Quit doing things that are loving. Quit leaving nice little notes. You know, says, hey, I love you today, you know, or put it under a pillow, get a little piece of chocolate or something. Or another. Man, it's easy to show somebody that you love them. That's the easiest thing in the world. Just do nice, sweet things and, uh, and, and, and self-sacrificing things and things that, you know, they're not showy and flashy, but just convey something, you know, uh, rearrange the Tupperware drawer or something, you know, I mean, come on, 
you can do that. I mean, make it make it where every time you open the open the 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 doors, the stuff doesn't fall out on you. How about that? That'd be that'd be nice, wouldn't it? And then leave a note. I did it for you, babe. I love you. You know, <laughs> put it on one of the Tupperware jars or something. Tupperware uh, cases. Anyway, all right, Sandy. Please.